Pule Kako Eko Mako Mako i loko kalani wa hoi ea mai mako i ke ala i loko ke aloha Ke ho nani ako nei mako ia oi no nga po mai ka ia pau au i haavi mai ai a mako Mahalo nui nga o ke ia Mauho aloha malihini Ka po e nui Ka po e li'i li'i I hoi ea mai mai nga vahi mamao nga vahi kokoke Nga noe ala ka ia mako manahana a pau Nga noe e ho'o po mai ka i ka pu Nga alaka'i, nga lakoi, ho'o makoukou, a ho'o la la ke i a aha, proclaim the peace. E kau ka maluhia, a me ke aloha, a me ka uhane hemo lele maluno makopakahi, a pau i loko ki a maula, o ki a kamako pule maka ino ka haku Yesu Kristo. E Hawaii he moku he kanaka. E mākou nga Hawaii e ho kipa aku nei a o kou nga malihini, nga kamaaina i ke ia aha. A e mākou, ke ho maika i aku nei i nga alakai, mai ke kula nui ka pele ki kena mai kona hope. Ma muli o ko lākou pono ke ho kipa ia nei o kou, a hiki ka ho pena o ki ia aha. No leila, e Hawaii, mai ka mai kipa. Kumu kahi, kahi e puko mai e ka lāhi ki ka velo ana, a hiki i le hua. E no mākou, nga Hawaii o ke kula nui, ke ho o kipa nei a o kou me ki aloha. Aloha. to, of course, mahalo to uh, that we saw some of our students and faculty from the, our Hawaiian Studies program, and uh, very grateful that they were uh, able to present to you uh, a, a formal greeting. So friends, colleagues, students, presenters, aloha mai kako. So as the academic vice president of this amazing university, I want to formally welcome you to our campus here. Uh, and I also want to express my sincere mahalo for the work that you're doing to proclaim, analyze, and reimagine notions of both peace and conflict. I'm intrigued by the premise, as discussed in Mason and Pulsifer's book, that conflict is not inherently bad, but potentially creative and necessary. I've actually spent Oh, I think I have slides here. <laughs> I've spent most of my career as a historian analyzing a story of conflict here in Hawaii between uh, groups of native Hawaiian surfers and non-Hawaiian individuals and organizations whose encroachment challenged the Hawaiian presence in a cultural space, basically the ocean and the surf. Although the approaches taken by these Hawaiians took on a mix of both creative and sometimes destructive forms, these surfers made important strides. Ultimately, they found a way to remain significant, present, not ignored. This is a big deal since most stories of conflict between native Hawaiians and colonial entities resulted in the marginalization of Hawaiians, sometimes rendering them voiceless. But on our campus here in Laie, uh, was founded on the premise of fostering unity amongst diverse peoples, particularly with our student body. Our vision has been to provide an opportunity from, for students from Oceania and the Asian Rim to live together in a kind of living laboratory 
raising up future world leaders who would work towards the establishment of peace internationally. It's a unique place with a grand mission. Our school's origin story begins in 1921 when a young David O. McKay was an apostle on assignment to tour missions outside the United States. He was a tall man with puffy hair and a large personality that apparently filled any room that he entered. Hawaii was merely a stopping place on his international tour. So while he was on this island of Oahu, he came out to visit Laie, most likely to see the new temple, which had been dedicated only 15 month, months prior. By the way, there were only five operating temples at that time. The fact that temple number five was in Hawaii in this small village of Laie in the middle of a sugarcane field is mind boggling. Uh, especially if you consider that temple number four was Salt Lake City. On February 7th, Elder McKay recorded in his journal that after eating a delicious breakfast at the temple president's house, that President Hugh Cannon and Smith and I went over to the school which is conducted under the direction of the mission and witnessed the most impressive and inspiring sight. There we go. 127 little, little children ranging from seven or eight years to 14 or 15 formed in order on the lawn and then marched to the flagpole and participated in the flag raising ceremony. Elder McKay mentioned specific students by name in 1921 in his journal and by their nationality. Particularly he noted the Hawaiian student William Ka'a, the American student Thomas Wadups, and the Japanese student Otokochi Matsumoto. While attending this morning exercise, Elder McKay was jarred by a spiritual experience that profoundly stuck with him for the next 34 years. When he looked at that motley group of youngsters all thrown into a so-called melting pot, Elder McKay explained, my bosom swelled with emotion and tears came to my eyes and I felt like I was, felt like bowing in prayer and thanksgiving. In 1955, 34 years later at the dedication of the, of the school, he recounted his 1921 experience. I actually have an audio record. great sense of pride in the opportunities provided by American deals, ideals of equality, McKay also celebrated the divine concept of unity amidst diversity, particularly through the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was also determined and inspired to build an institution of higher learning in Hawaii, a college for the saints in Hawaii and the Pacific. But as a young apostle with limited administrative authority to bring his vision to fruition in 1921, Elder McKay had to wait 34 years. Have you ever, this always fascinates me. I mean, think about however, how, how long have you held on to a dream? <laughs> and uh, how meaningful does that dream have to remain fresh in the queue for 34 years? But not only do I marvel at the stamina of his desire to build this institution of higher education here in Laie, but I'm also convinced that this profound experience of seeing unity and diversity in the gospel at the elementary school in Laie in 1921 opened his eyes to the future of the church, an international one. Many historians recognize David O. McKay as the prophet who ushered in the church into its international phase. Under his leadership, the church grew exponentially, particularly internationally. He also emphasized a shift from the notion of gathering Zion in a single place to uniting decentralized stakes of Zion stretched throughout the world. Did his experience in Laie 1921 shape that trajectory? To me, the story of BYU Hawaii's origins is inextricably linked to the expansion of the church. As a historian, I'm 
also compelled to consider the broader, broader historical context of the time period. In 1921, much of American society was separated by legalized racial segregation. Although Utah didn't officially have segregated schools, they nonetheless had some racially discriminatory laws, laws that prohibited interracial marriages, for example. Many American schools were segregated by race, though, in 1921. In fact, it wasn't until 1954, the same year that President McKay announced the Church College of Hawaii, the, uh, a racially integrated school in Laie, that segregated schools in America were deemed unconstitutional through the famous court case Brown versus Board of Education. In many ways, David O. McKay was ahead of his time, at least here in Hawaii, and forward in his thinking by establishing a racially integrated, diverse college here in Laie. After becoming president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President McKay announced his plan to establish this uh, school, and he appointed Reuben D. Law, who, by the way, is the author of the book that they put in your bag. I highly recommend that book. Um, it's older but uh, it's a great source, and there's a lot of primary material in it. But Law organized uh, this committee, and he, was, he came to Hawaii in 1954, and he started to assess um, you know, when they could build the school, and he said you know, he knew David Omeke was anxious to get the school started, but he didn't realize how anxious he was, because right after they stuck the shovel in the ground, um, President David Omeke said, hey, can we have classes start in September, which was seven months away. <laughs> And uh, so in that very short time, and I think this is an important point to make, you know, it was amazing that David O'Kay has this vision, but people have to bring your vision to fruition, right? Um, and so in a very short time, there are a lot of faithful people who brought this dream to reality. So I want to mention amazing people, particularly one uh, named Ethel Helani Whitford, who was head of registrars that found an entire student body of 153 students in the matter of two and a half months and service missionaries from Hawaii and, and Oceania who built the campus. Um, they had temporary buildings at first, but you know, they eventually built the campus over the next three years. President Law describes the opening day of school, and uh, let's see if I can go. So we, they, this is a, an image here of the first day of school, and it was held at the chapel down in Laie by the uh, temple. And it says here, uh, According to President Law, true to prophetic vision, the college was now a reality and the official opening an important event in history. We were pioneers and it was exciting to be involved with the Church College of Hoi. The faculty and staff were very compatible and the students were wonderful. We had 153 students that first historic year and it has continued to grow. Today we're still pretty small. We have about 3,000 students. There were only 20 full-time faculty hired to work at Church College of Hoi in 1955. And uh, some of those pictured here. What intrigues me is that 25% of the first faculty hires in 1955 were women. In 1956, the university started offering Samoan and Hawaiian language classes, taught respectively by Fea Ngai um, Naleai and Clinton Kanahele. This is significant since the territorial government in Hawaii didn't allow Hawaiian language in our public schools. And the fact that we taught native languages here 20 years before a, a Hawaiian revitalization of language reflects the way that we valued culture in those formative years. Portable buildings were used as dorms and classrooms while campus was being moved. I think I have some pictures of the campus. The girls' dormitory was on the hill near the temple, while the boys were housed a couple of miles away at Kokololio Beach Park. <laughs> So, I mean, we do have a really amazing history, and hopefully while you're here, you feel a bit of that spirit and that tradition and that, and that mission. Um, this campus does have the ability to uplift, uplift underrepresented students and also to build future leaders toward the establishment of peace internationally. Thank you for helping us along in our journey. This conference indeed aligns with the mission of our institution. Mahalo. Thank you, Vice President Walker. Uh, 
And uh, I have to say, I am thrilled to be here. I can also say with a fair degree of certainty that I've never had so much bling around my neck as I do at this moment. Uh, it's pretty, pretty special. Uh, it is a rare honor for any author to have a conference organized uh, around a book that you write. Uh, this is really special for David and for me. Um, we're very grateful to everyone who's had a hand in organizing this. We're grateful to Brigham Young uh, University in Hawaii for hosting us, grateful to President Kawe, grateful to President, uh, Vice President Walker for their tremendous support. Uh, we are so thankful uh, and in awe of what's going on at the David O. McKay Center for Intercultural Understanding. David Whippy, Chad Ford, Sidney Short, the whole team everybody who made this happen, so thank you. Um, we're uh, equally grateful to the co-sponsors of the conference, Neil A. Maxwell, Neil, Neil A. Maxwell, easy enough for me to say, Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University in Provo. Uh, we're grateful for uh, lots of folks from the Maxwell Institute who are here uh, uh, this, this week. Um, Phil Barlow, Jeremy King, Joseph Stewart, uh, others. Uh, we miss Spencer Fluman, the executive director who couldn't be with us because of health reasons, but Spencer has just been uh, a champion of this project and this conference from day one. Uh, so Spencer, we miss you. Um, and we are also grateful to the Maxwell Institute who co-published the book along with Deseret Book. Uh, our editors, uh, Miranda Wilcox and Morgan Davis were phenomenal. Uh, at Deseret Book, Lisa Roper and Laurel Christensen Day shepherded it through the, the process there and, and just got behind the project from day one. Uh, a special thank you goes to Grace Pulsifer, uh, David and Don's daughter, who designed the cover uh, of, of the book. Uh, how, how old was she when she designed it? 15 years old. So a graphic designer in the making and uh, already has a line on her resume. Uh, uh, so. And what really what makes this occasion doubly special for me is that I get to share it with my friend, co-author, and overall remarkable human being, David Pulsifer. We spent literally a decade working on this project together. And the process of learning from and thinking alongside David uh, was just enormously gratifying. It's one of, the, one of the really pivotal things in my life. Um, but having a gathering here in paradise isn't a bad bonus. Uh, so, so we are very eager to hear from all of the presenters, to learn from each of you, to have the discussions. I, I love that, that we've structured in lots of time for, for questions, for conversation, because uh, we want to learn from, from all of you. Uh, we already have a pretty good idea of what we think. We, we want to know what you all think. Um, but we have been asked at the beginning of each day to offer a few introductory remarks, so, so we'll do that. Uh, both we, the, the way that David and I have decided to do this is that we will introduce some of the key arguments of the book, some of the, the key contributions we think, uh, but then also highlight some areas where we know that our thinking is incomplete uh, or where uh, we have to go or maybe where we got some things wrong. We've had a number of people very kindly point out some things that we've gotten wrong so far. So, uh, so we, uh, we're, we're eager to hear from you. So, so let me dive in uh, to, uh, to, to my remarks and then David will take it from there. I am a child of God, for he has sent me here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. To be a human child of God is to exist in the already but still forming tension of being a peacemaker. God has made us for peacemaking. Jesus has called us to peacemaking. And the Holy Spirit impels us toward and sanctifies our peacemaking. The next two days, we'll dive into the culture and the praxis of peace. Today, we focus on theology. Why theology? Because we believe that right thinking precedes and conditions right action. Elder Boyd K. Packer often taught, true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. 
Similarly, Reverend Otis Moss III, who's pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, one of America's great preachers, wrote that when you have no theology, then you have a messed up psychology, and you can't have the right sociology, and you'll have a skewed anthropology. So it's essential for us to get to the psychology, sociology, anthropology, culture, and practice of peace. But since Latter-day Saint peace building is grounded in our shared religious ideals, we have to get our theology right. David Bentley Hart, who's one of the leading Christian theologians working today, recently wrote, Christianity entered human history not as a new creed or a wise path or a system of religious observances, but as apocalypse. The sudden unveiling of a mystery hidden in God before the foundation of the world in a historical event without any possible precedent or any conceivable sequel. An overturning of all the orders and hierarchies of the age, here on earth and in the heavens above. The overthrow of all the demonic powers and principalities by a slave, legally crucified at the behest of all the religious and political authorities of his time, but raised up by God as the one sole Lord over all the cosmos. Hold that thought. One recent commentator about our book called it aspirational theology. By this, she generously meant that proclaimed peace points us towards something Latter-day Saints have not achieved, but strive for. That's a lovely thought, and I think it's largely true. We don't yet live in Zion, although this kind of feels like it. <laughs> but in another sense, to call a theology of peace building aspirational is to suggest that our current theology is something else, and we have to change it in order for it to become what it may someday be. Again, this may be true in terms of our feeble application of the good news of Jesus, but restoration theology does not aspire to peace. It proclaims peace. The nonviolent core of the good news of Jesus, restored, has been there all along, hiding in plain sight. Christians don't need to aspire toward a peace-building theology. God has revealed it to us again and again and again and again. Every time Jesus, the Prince of Peace, breaks into the world, he proclaims peace. This happened in first century Palestine, as witnessed in the New Testament. This happened in the first century Promised Land, as witnessed in the Book of Mormon and in modern times as witnessed in the restoration. When Jesus enters human history, he changes it. If there is one recurrent thread, one overarching theme, one signal takeaway from our book, it is this. God's apocalypse, the self-revelation of the divine in the coming of Jesus to the world, is transformative, not simply as a matter of history, or of religion making, or of some future eschatological age. To return to David Bentley Hart, who's simply paraphrasing scripture, the coming of Jesus overturns all earthly orders and hierarchies, overthrows all earthly powers and principalities. In their place, he inaugurates the nonviolent kingdom of God. David and I really believe that the restoration has some something to teach the world about peace. And we hope by the time you finish the book, you'll agree. Admittedly, in the hierarchy of world religions, the restoration is the new kid on the block. Other religions have a little bit of a head start on us. But we are convinced that the restoration's distinctive sacred scriptures, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, add to the Bible in offering wisdom that is applicable for a wider world. The restoration is for all the children of God. At the heart of this revealed wisdom are several core ideas. All humans are inherently divine and eternally interrelated. Enduring power can be achieved only through persuasion and love. Conflict is built into creation and can be constructively transformed for positive purposes. 
In very rare instances, violence may be justified, but only nonviolent responses based in love are truly sanctifying and efficacious in the long term. And Zion, the restoration's term for the beloved community of those who collectively follow the principles taught by Jesus Christ, is not simply an otherworldly or future aspiration, but rather an achievable aim for this world if individuals and societies will embrace love, equality, justice, and peace. Along with modern-day prophets and apostles, we affirm that Latter-day Saints are called to clearly speak out for peace and to become a people of peace and reconciliation. That's Elder Uchtdorf. We believe with President Russell M. Nelson that any war is a horrifying violation of everything the Lord Jesus Christ stands for and teaches. That peace is possible in this world and that followers of Jesus Christ should set the example for all the world to follow. This begins with inner peace and interpersonal peace, but extends far beyond that. What our Savior taught about peace in the life of a single person, President Dallin H. Oaks taught, also applies to peace in a family, peace in a nation, and peace in the world. Why do we believe this? Because God transformed the world through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Because the assertive love that Jesus displayed on the cross, compounded by the everlasting victory he won through his atonement and resurrection, solidifies a different calculation of cause and effect, predicated on an eternal standard of power and influence that is maintained only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. Because, as Paul's epistle to the Ephesians attests, he is our peace. In his flesh, he has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. We love God because God loved us first. So, too. We proclaim peace because Jesus proclaimed peace first. The Restoration's theology of peace is nothing more or less than our opportunity to live out our shared humanity and God's radical inbreaking of love into the world. I look forward to the conference. really is uh, a stunning, overwhelming opportunity to be here, um, and the last 10 years um, has really has been a remarkable, wonderful journey um, with Patrick. Um, so grateful to extend that journey now to a larger group, um, hopefully um, at least for a few days. Uh, Patrick and I define theology <coughs> as reasoned reflection on doctrine, to separate it from doctrine. If one of the purposes of theology is to be a tool for comprehending and describing ultimate reality, then any theological endeavor is bound to fail in fundamental ways. Like the proverbial blind men and the elephant, our efforts will always be constrained by our individual and cultural limitations. We are going to misinterpret what we encounter, mistaking an elephant's ear for a fan, a leg for a tree, a tail for a rope. But even fundamental errors can provide some level of enlightenment. An elephant's ear is somewhat like a fan. Its leg is somewhat like a tree. Its tail is somewhat like a rope. Even if the whole elephant is actually unlike any of these. What's important, of course, is to compare notes. Theology, like most endeavors, works best as a collaborative effort. Even though we will likely still be spectacularly wrong, even or maybe especially on a collective level, the process itself is useful. The relationships we nurture with each other, with those who have gone before, with those who will come at later, have the potential to enrich the world. As we challenge and learn from each other's encounters with the elephant, we can, with love and concern for the common good, 
knit our hearts and our communities together. In that spirit, proclaim peace is an imperfect and, pro and constrained attempt to comprehend and describe a small part of the elephant, a rough sketch of what we might call a Latter-day Saint theology of peace and nonviolence. Having posited our interpretation, we are eager to hear the perspectives of others because we suspect that the fan we've sketched may not match the tree that others have encountered. We've approached the project with a particular set of individual and cultural blinders, two white guys from the Salt Lake Valley who have never known deprivation or violence in any significant way. Those blinders ensure that our interpretations will be skewed in certain directions that may not resonate with people from other experiences and backgrounds. We hope that despite the egregious er these egregious errors, our interpretation of the elephant may still have some utility, may still offer some degree of enlightenment and ultimately may pr prove useful, by which we mean that, they that these interpretations can help us love with greater capacity. Still, the errors are there. In our fumbling blindness with awkward hands, we've stumbled onto strange shapes and textures in the Restoration Scripture, the primary site of our encounters. We've done our best to make sense of them, but we seek greater clarity about what we found. We yearn for the benefit of other perspectives. We posit a universe, for example, where agency and consent are the sources of all power and influence, including divine power. A universe where godly power, power that endures eternally, can only be created through love and trust. But is that model useful? Does it match the experiences of other encounters and contexts? Does it help us love better? We suggest a universe in which, the, in which conflict is unavoidable and even essential to the process of creation and that the essential distinction is not whether conflict will happen, but how it will be engaged, with love or with malice. Is that embrace of creative conflict useful? Does it correlate with others' experiences? Does it help us love better? We propose an interpretation of the atonement of Jesus Christ, in which the salvific work of Christ's suffering in the garden is distinct from the salvific work effect of Christ's suffering on the cross. That's the f uh, that the focus of the garden is individual, salvation from our personal sins, and the focus on the cross is social, salvation from our collective sins. But is that distinction useful? What questions or problems does it create? Does it help us love better? We attempt to solve the question, I'll put that in quotes, solve the question of uh, questions around divine violence, probably our trickiest theological problem by suggesting that the example of the condescended Jesus who consistently employs nonviolent power and influence is the model God's children should adopt on earth rather than the example of the ascended Christ who violently destroys thousands of people in the Americas in the wake of his crucifixion. Is that distinction useful? Is it true to the scriptural record? Does it help us love better? These are just some of the questions that we have. There are others of which we aren't even aware because we are blind to them. But we've come today with hearts open to receive the gifts of insight that you are here to bestow. Thank you. Very nice that this pulpit doesn't kind of go down for very loud sound. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I am so honored and grateful to be here. So the other day I was working at my kitchen table when the phone beeped. It was my friend who said, have you seen those signs about the un upcoming meeting to preserve integrity in education? I said, you mean the group that was behind all those insane bills in the state legislature? Like teachers have to post a curriculum online 30 days in advance for public comment. The parents can sue teachers if they disagree with what the teacher says. Yes, said my friend, I have a scheduled conflict, but I want you to go and be a voice of reason. I said, there's no point in that. Those people are wacko and they're mean. <laughs> well, someone has to say something. I 
Yes, I doubt they'll ask for comment. That's the whole point of their movement, pretending people like me don't exist. Just go, she said. I know you'll find the right time to speak up. So I went to the event. Uh, the organizers said that there was too much information to share, so they would not be taking any questions. So I just sat and listened. By the end, I was annoyed and discouraged. They saw insidious plots behind words like diversity, college readiness, and even compassion. What, were they saying we should instead value homogeneity, college unreadiness, and malice? <laughs> There's no way to reason with these crazy people, I thought. They have to be stopped. As my friend and I prepared to leave, one of the main speakers turned around and greeted me. I think I've seen you around, she said. That's the problem with being a bald Asian Latter-day Saint woman. You've seen one, you've seen them all. We struck up a conversation. I told her about my family's many experiences of racism in our local community. Like the time a friend at school um, told a kid in my family, I can't play with you because your skin is too dark. She said, kids say stuff like that. Talking about race is divisive. I said, when you say that, I feel like you're not listening to me. Are you listening to me? She asked. Okay, I said, are you a Latter-day Saint? Yes. What do you think about President Nelson's calling on the Latter-day Saints to lead out and abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice? That's exactly what I'm doing, she said. This victim mentality is divisive and it pits people against each other. Okay, I said, but what about the joint statement President Nelson made with the NAACP when they said racism also existed in institutional structures of law and government? What about President Oak saying root out racism? That's exactly what I'm doing, she said. Anti-racism is evil. It's in our education system, and I'm rooting it out. I stood there completely gobsmacked. We had taken the same prophetic charge and run with it in completely opposite directions. I think we'll have to agree to disagree, she said. She smiled kindly and also with an air of finality. I'm not really sure why. I was physically unwell. I was being passive aggressive. I couldn't take no for an answer. But at that moment, I started to cry. Tears fell from my eyes as I held her gaze. I'm so frustrated, I said. We both made the same sacred covenants. I don't understand how there can be this huge gap between us. Why doesn't God fix it? And she hugged me. I don't know, she said, but you're my sister and I love you. We stood there looking at each other. I wonder what she was thinking. I'm so frustrated, I said. I don't understand. We stood there for a few moments more, staring across the gulf between us. Then we embraced again, and that was the end of the conversation. I felt in that conversation with a person I've long vilified that she was sincerely trying to do the right thing. In a space where she had much more power and prestige than I did, she made time for me. She initiated the conversation, and even when she was ready to go but I wasn't, she waited. I can be a positive character witness for her. I disagree with her assumptions, her policies, and most of all, her history. But I can't deny that in some way she's a person after my own heart, an energetic woman trying to fix a broken world. We're both trying to fight evil with good. In chapter four, Proclaim Peace, A Theology of Conflict, Pulsifer and Mason argue that, quote, conflict is a necessary aspect of our existence to be embraced and harnessed for its creative capacities rather than avoided or vilified. It is a natural outgrowth of a world that God divided and beautified and then proclaimed to be very good, close quote. Latter-day Saint philosopher Randall Paul has pointed out that difference and conflict are so fundamental, they go back to even before the creation of the world. In heaven, God's spirit children had a major disagreement over the best pass forward. We talk about the council in heaven, but should note that there was also a conflict in heaven, which remains unresolved. Apparently, even an omniscient, omnipotent God has limited power in convincing God's children to do things God's way. No wonder parenting is so hard. Mason and Pulsifer's theology of conflict steers us away from the easy momentum of fear and toward the more difficult slope of love, forgiveness, trust, and selflessness. Indeed, as I read through chapter four, um, with the recent encounter with the school board po politics in my head, I laughed out loud several times as the authors predicted each of my knee-jerk reactions to these political opponents. Indignation, wrath, plots for vengeance against them, plots for the complete annihilation of the enemy. <laughs> my sense that, quote, their violence is unnecessary and evil, while ours is requisite and righteous, close quote. But now I've had an experience my positive character witness of someone I thought was a horrible person. I can't deny that positive witness any more than I can deny the witness of the Holy Spirit. And indeed, maybe those are one and the same. I'm convinced my Mason and Pulsifer's argument that conflict is an integral part of our moral education and necessary for growth. 
But as a Latter-day Saint, I'm still deeply troubled by this problem, which is, I love my baptismal and temple covenants. They connect me to fellow Latter-day Saints all around the world, to mourn with those that mourn, to comfort those in need of comfort, to bear one another's burdens, to establish Zion together, no matter how great the cost. These covenant connections are precious to me. United by our covenants, Latter-day Saints have the potential to do so much good. But what about when the enemies, that is, one's opponents or antagonists in one's attempt to change the world for the better, are one's very own covenant sisters and brothers? Isn't covenant conflict a big problem? Our worldwide Latter-day Saint Fellowship makes sisters and brothers of people in every walk of life across political ideologies, socioeconomic circumstances, and cultures of moral common sense, from left-wing socialists to right-wing nationalists, to people living on less than $1.90 a day, to billionaires, to activists for and against innumerable vital causes such as climate change and democratic elections. Just going through that list gives one pause. Does it feel depressing because of our huge inequality? Because of the contamination by one or another I ideology or identity? Because just by existing in our diverse positionalities and trajectories, we're canceling each other out? Under such conditions, how can we, the Latter-day Saints, possibly be one? How can we transform the world for good when we can't even transform ourselves, a mere 0.02% of the world's vast living population, to say nothing of the dead? How can we be all be on the same covenant path when we are, in fact, regularly headed in opposite directions, blocking each other's way, tripping each other up? As a hiker and runner, I love the image of the covenant path. I think about the exhilarating climbs, the sketchy edges, the danger of being lost in the wilderness. The linear image makes sense in conjunction with Jesus' metaphors about the straight and narrow way. Uh, we've got the iron rod as well. It makes sense as a way of describing a journey of progression from point A and flawed stumbling mortality to point B, the glory and power of our heavenly parents. But the path metaphor is not so helpful for visualizing our relationships with others as we journey through mortality. We don't all navigate the same terrain. Latter-day Saints are not all on the same path in terms of their life experiences, goals, assumptions, and actions. It would be nice if the person I spoke to at that meeting were standing right beside me as we rode a covenant conveyor belt straight through life, passing all the necessary milestones, seeing the same scenery. Of course, this is precisely the plan pos proposed by Satan. Hop on the moving walkway, stay in line, and you will get from point A to point B, but with little growth, discovery, or initiative. Clearly, because of differences in our birth, locality, and language, lived experience, and so on, making and keeping the same covenants with the same God does not necessarily put us all on the same path or on the same page. Sometimes I don't think we even exist on the same planet. <laughs> but when I want to think about planets, I turn to Kolob. <laughs> As Terrell Givens has recently argued, the Book of Abraham, along with other books in the Pearl of Great Price, is one of the most theologically dense repositories of Restoration Scripture. For example, in chapter 3, verses 22 to 28, they're often cited to explain the Latter-day Saint beliefs that our souls were eternal intelligences that existed before the creation of the physical world, that the physical world as we experience it was not created out of nothing but organized out of existing material, and that prior to enacting this creation, God announced to those pre-existent souls a plan of entering physicality to be tried and tested, a plan that some accepted but which many rejected. Mason and Pulsifer skillfully read these verses in Abraham 3, 23 to 28, and corresponding verses in Moses 4 to show the significance of agency in Latter-day Saint theology. Agency was so important to God's plan, we had to be allowed to come to earth to fail, to hurt each other, to do permanent damage, to get in each other's way. Agency was so important that a huge contingent of souls were able to just walk away from the plan itself, despite the power, omniscience, and glory of God. But if we get so much out of the last six verses, why do we usually skip over the first 21 verses? <laughs> if you read it, you'll find out. Uh, <laughs> if the last bit is about the eternal significance of agency, what's the first big section about? I believe the first part of Abraham chapter 3 is about the eternal fact of difference, of positionality, that is both extremely significant to the entities that are different from each other and extremely insignificant from God's perspective. This theology of difference goes hand in hand with our theologies of agency and eternal progression. A caveat is just one of many possible readings of the text. I'm not reading the verses with an eye toward making comprehensive correspondences between the text and our contemporary understanding of astronomy. Um, there's three things we notice about the text. I'm going to kind of skip things because I've gotten the five-minute warning. So first, there's a discourse of reckoning, which is a subjective measuring depending on one's positionality. Second, there's a repeating of the phase, 
uh, phrase, these two facts exist, or these two things exist, also with an emphasis on comparing two things, um, one that's always different from the second by a certain degree, but then there's always a third thing beyond the second by some other degree, and on and on and on until one approaches near where God is. Third, there's a suggestive parallel between heavenly bodies and eternal souls, in unfathomably numerous, but each known to God, and in time, potentially, um, within the understanding of the eternal souls with distinctive characteristics and characters who become more like God as they grow in intelligence, that is light and truth. Okay, so reckoning. Um, again, I'm going to skip over this a little bit because I'm running out of time. Verses 4 through 9 all use the word reckoning to describe the way that one measures something else and how this depends, this measurement depends on the position and perspective of the one doing the measuring. Reckoning is a word that describes measuring, judging, or interpreting, but from a particular subjective point of view. So, for example, one revolution of Kolob, a heavenly body, was a day unto the Lord, quote, a day unto the Lord, after the Lord's manner of reckoning, it being 1,000 years according to the time of the earth. This is the reckoning of the Lord's time according to the reckoning of Kolob. And it talks about the, the earth and the moon in a similar way. Um, the earth reckons things in uh, a certain way according to itself. And it makes sense to us from the perspective of what we understand about astronomy, planets, various orbits, their rotations, and also our self-centeredness. We on earth measure everything according to what we experience. We talk about the sun going up and coming down, even th though in fact the earth is revolving and the sun's not going anywhere. But the point of this discourse of reckoning suggests that even things we accept as the way things are, such as time, vary widely depending on one's positionality. We're always characterizing others, evaluating others, and we're also subject to others' reckoning. Okay, the second thing, two things exist. Throughout this um, chunk of text, there's this phrase, two facts exist, uh, two facts do exist, two things exist, um, and mentions of two things and two spirits, this two-ness. Um, and God calls Abraham's attention to it. And the point is, along with there's always... Um, in verse 7 and 8, verse 16 and 17, there's always these co comparisons. There's these two things that exist um, in different spatial positions with regard to each other and a, and a significant difference between them. But beyond that, there's even more things and more and more and more all the way up to where God is or what God is. Um, the same thing exists with regard to eternal intelligences in verses 18 and 19. Um, with a significant difference. When talking about intelligences, um, there's a recognition that People vary, uh, intelligences vary in their degrees of intelligence, not a high I IQ or access to a prep school education, but the degree to which they embody God's light and truth. But notwithstanding this difference, God says in verse 18, we're all fundamentally on an equal footing with each other because souls have no beginning. They existed before, they shall have no end, and they shall exist after, for they are nolam or eternal. So there's these differences uh, between people, but... Um, but the differences are actually not that significant when you compare them to God, who is more intelligent than all. So in sum, the discussion of two-ness of heavenly bodies and eternal spirits compared to the infinite wholeness of God's vastness and intelligence sets out a clear teaching. Difference, positionality, is a fact of the reality that human beings and God jointly inhabit. Um, at the level of two-ness, comparing one another, these differences may seem tremendous, like the difference between the earth and the moon. But in God's eyes, and compared to God's stature, God's everythingness, these differences are insignificant. Okay, and I'm going to skip over this last bit where um, I say uh, the, the verses in the part of Ab Abraham um, where God like, puts God's hand over Abraham's eyes, opening Abraham's eyes to the vastness of the universe, all the stars which Abraham can't keep track of, which God then begins to name one by one. Um, in the context of the Abrahamic covenant and the vast seed, uh, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, that makes us think um, you know, there's this clear allusion to God being able to see all of us and knowing us one by one. So in sum, these, uh, these um, in light of these the readings in the book of Abraham, which emphasize the reality of difference, the eternal facts which do exist, um, we don't have to feel so worried frustrated at the gap between perhaps me and my political enemy, who's also my covenant sister. At least I shouldn't feel as if God is being a neglectful plumber, failing to fix a pipe that's broken and gushing water. Difference, even between those who share ideologies, beliefs, and rights, is not a symptom of brokenness and disease. It is um, the eternal fact of difference and God's ability to encompass and embrace difference in contrast to the way we, God's mortal children, are often perturbed and confounded by the power of petty differences is a comfort in the midst of conflict. 
when we find intractable difference in the world and society, in the church, in Sunday school, or our family, we need not panic that something is broken and God needs to fix it. Instead, we should feel this point of difference as a foothold in diverse humanity, a way to, like God, grasp the cosmos by reaching out a hand to touch another. My membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is, for me, an opportunity to connect the world's many differences, a way to feel the vast differences that separate God's children, my covenant connections, which I hold sacred and inviolable, which I know bind me to others with the same strength they bind me to God, give me the safety and the freedom to explore those differences and conflicts, both within my own church community and more widely within the larger communities and people where Zion has roots. As the church grows, these kinds of differences and conflicts will only increase over distance, culture, language, generations, giving us further opportunities to transcend our narrow reckonings and see as God sees. Thank you. grateful to be with you. Uh, it's always an honor to share the podium with Melissa. If Spencer Freeman is at home watching today, I want him to know that we miss him. Patrick and David's Proclaim Peace is a work of substance and power that deserves a place at the core of restoration thinking for the next hundred years. It exemplifies the most important kind of theological work, thinking carefully and rigorously about what it would mean to actually do what the gospel promises. I'm in profound agreement with the text at nearly every level. That said, I have a few lingering questions. <laughs> Fortunately, these three nested questions line up neatly with the book's own. One, what exactly is peace? What is the nature of power? Uh, what is the nature of reality? It seems to me that answers to these three questions are tightly intertwined. The nature of peace depends on the nature of power, and the nature of power depends on the structure of reality. Let's start with the most basic question. What is the nature of reality? In the book's opening pages, Patrick and David make two fundamental claims about the structure of reality. One, reality is irreducibly composed of interdependent relationships. As they say, at first glance, the universe described in Joseph Smith's revelations might seem like a libertarian paradise of hyper-individualism, but it is, in fact, a web of profound interconnectivity and interdependence. Two, as a result, reality is fundamentally structured by what they call conflicts or tensions or what we might also call disequilibriums. Again, as Patrick and David say in the introduction, conflict is built into creation. In short, by seeing reality as relational, interdependent, and structured by dynamic conflicts or tensions, Patrick and David have essentially claimed that reality is fundamentally ecological. To be real is to be embedded in an ecosystem. Now, I think that this ecological account of reality is basically right, profoundly mm -hmm. heretical as it may be from the perspective of a traditional Christian metaphysics that prioritizes God's impassibility and absolute sovereignty as the true measure of what's real. I'm just not entirely sure at the end of the day how far Patrick and David are willing to go down the rough road required for this kind of metaphysics. This, too, is what I hope to find out, because as beautiful and intuitively appealing as this interdependent picture of reality can be, the cost of sticking with it may be staggeringly high, perhaps too high. To help frame the potential cost of this ecological take on reality, and thus this ecological take on peace, I want to start by posing a simple but I think decisive question. This is my most important question for Patrick and David. I 
kind of gave it away in the <laughs> title. <laughs> Do resurrected bodies need to eat? Jesus certainly demonstrated that a resurrected body can eat, but I'm asking a different question. I'm asking if a resurrected body needs to eat. By default, I suspect most Latter-day Saints would join the larger Christian tradition and automatically answer no. Fair enough. But here's the problem. If we say no, no, of course, resurrected bodies don't need to eat. That would be silly and defeat the whole point of having a perfect and incorruptible body. Then I believe we've already backed out of both of the metaphysical claims identified above. We've already posited a divine, perfected version of life that's sovereign and self-contained and self-sufficient and not continually dependent on other lives for its own life. We've already posited a version of life that isn't wholly grounded in relationships and that isn't interdependent. Or again, in short, we've posited a version of divine life that isn't inherently ecological. Now again, perhaps this is right. Perhaps in the resurrection, life is alchemical, frictionless, and self-sustaining. Perhaps in the resurrection, life is fixed, permanent, independent, and thus not ecological. Perhaps life is free of need. Perhaps life itself no longer requires sacrifice. This is certainly what many people, even Latter-day Saints, automatically assume. But if we believe that reality in general, and life in particular, is truly, fundamentally, and irreparably interdependent, then there's no reason to expect that there are any exceptions to this rule, especially divine exceptions, that as divine would then inevitably be the rule and not an exception. If resurrected bodies are still ecological, then there's no reason to expect that resurrected bodies don't need to eat. And if resurrected bodies need to eat, then something must be eaten. And then we're back to the problem of violence. Or, or at least conflict. <laughs> and thus we're back to Patrick and, Patrick and David's original question, what exactly is peace? Consider now the question of power. If reality is ecological, then what is the nature of power? It seems to me that for power to exist, two general conditions must hold. One, reality must be dynamic. That is, the world must be in motion, things must be subject to change, time must hold sway. And two, reality must be structured by disequilibriums, that is, by imbalances or differences or differential relationships. To borrow a turn of phrase from Abraham III, we might say that the rule of power is this, if two things exist, there shall be one above another. Or if two things exist, one shall have something the other doesn't. These differential imbalances are the engine of creation. They set the world in motion. Every relationship requires exchange, and such exchanges are always driven by disequilibrium. For power to be real, something must be needed. Some scarcity must exist. This is the nature of power. Power is the circulation driven by imbalances of giving and taking, or Power is the circulation of energy through the web of an ecosystem, through the food chain of the real, which is to say that power is ecological. Now, as we know it, in every single example from the whole history of the world, life is always borrowed. All lives are always composed of other lives. In this sense, life is a lot like a game of musical chairs. Life is borrowed. It must circulate. And given the fact that some imbalance, need, or scarcity must exist for power to be real, there are never enough chairs for everyone to sit down at the same time. As best I can tell, this is what it would mean to say that reality is ecological, or that conflict is built into creation. There are never enough chairs. If everyone could simultaneously have their own chair, then life would be independent rather than interdependent. We've come full circle then to the question of peace. What exactly is peace? This focus on what Patrick and David describe as positive peace. Positive peace, they say, quote, refers to a state of affairs in which justice, equity, and an abiding commitment to the common good is built into the very structures of society. Again, I'm in complete agreement with this definition. Peace depends on justice. But what is justice? 
If every ecosystem is like a game of musical chairs, and if justice is a way of addressing the conflicts that then inevitably arise, then how are these conflicts resolved? We might think about the work of justice then in two different ways. First, we might think about justice as the work of making sure that everyone finally has their own chair. Justice is served and peace is achieved when the game of musical chairs finally, mercifully ends. Justice is accomplished when we finally escape the taxing necessity of continually borrowing and sharing and circulating life and power. This first approach, I believe, aligns with Christianity's traditional account of eschatological peace. Peace is achieved when lions stop eating lambs. Again, this might be the right answer. It might certainly be the case, as nearly everyone expects, that resurrected bodies don't get hungry and resurrected bodies don't need to eat. But also, again, if justice requires the elimination of need and dependence, then I don't see how reality can also be fundamentally interdependent. We might, of course, allow that in this needy and temporary world, we need a backup plan, an ad hoc approximation of justice until we can escape into heaven. In this case, we'll need a plan B to deal with this world's regrettable shortage of chairs. Plan B would allow for something like peace and justice in a world of shared needs. It would allow for justice to unfold as a divinely mandated way of handling this world's shortage of chairs. And as a result, it would allow for the fact that this earthly facsimile of justice would require things like sacrifice and consecration to manage the shared and limited resources currently circulating through the world's bottleneck ecosystems. That's one approach. But what would the second approach to peace and justice look like? The second approach is simple. It sticks to its guns regarding the nature of reality. Reality really is relational and interdependent all the way down, now and forever. And as a result, it concludes that there's no such thing as plan A. There's only plan B. The second approach is just plan B. Peace, for real and for keeps, hinges on a divinely mandated way of handling reality's perpetual shortage of chairs. We might frame this same problem one last way. Patrick and David are careful to distinguish between violence and conflict. While violence is always a choice, they say, conflict is built into the structure of creation. While violence is destructive, conflict is potentially creative. I'm on board with this. But what is the nature of creative conflict? And what relation does creation itself bear to violence and destruction? When we cleanly distinguish violence from conflict, are we positing a mode of creation that is not simultaneously destructive? Or do even creative forms of conflict still involve a dimension of destruction and thus violence? If the former is the case, then we again have a version of plan A in which it's possible for everyone to have a chair and for no one to get eaten. But if the latter is the case, if all acts of creation still involve a dimension of destruction, then I suspect that the nature of our task as thinkers of peace has changed in a critical way. The root model for peace can no longer be plan A. God's own assumed impassibility and sovereign independence. In fact, our root model for peace will have to take its bearings from an explicit rejection of that eschatological model of ecological supersessionism largely taken for granted by Christianity in general. If resurrected bodies still need to eat, then peace and violence, not just peace and conflict, may be irreparably intertwined. And if reality is truly and fundamentally relational and interdependent, then all peace-building efforts may involve grappling with and essentially, and not just accidentally or temporarily, tragic dimensions. Are all peace-building efforts, then, a redemptive form of mourning? These, then, are my two questions for Patrick and David. Do resurrected bodies need to eat? And will there ever be enough chairs? Thank you.
kapu mo lai e kawai mo lai e malo e tapu mo e tangata i fonua mo pesile i fonua o lai e kai ata pe angofua ai fanga ke kau i fatongi area o e ahoni I begin with a honorific sacred salutation to this ancestral Aina, indigenous people of Laie. Acknowledge the two name of the Ahupua'a, the land district of this area, Laie Kawai, Laie Malo'o. And also my respect to the indigenous people of here of Laie. In Tongan tradition, I must ask for permission to be able to speak in this particular space because of the tapu and the sacredness of, of this area. So I seek that permission at this point. I am going to take an intertextuality reading of proclaimed peace from an indigenous Tongan philosophical point of view taking specifically from the 20 years that I have been involved in creating and formulating an indigenous philosophy based on Tongan um, theology that is known as Ta and Va, or time and space. And um, what I, I'm not going to uh, spend this talk about Ta Vaism, so if you want to learn more about that, you'll have to take my class. <laughs> But I'm gonna, just going to focus specifically on this idea of duality, dualism, some refer to as binary, and take a critique of it, but also sort of kind of build on the aspect that were raised in the book. Now, the indigenous philosophy is grounded on this idea of hoa. Now, hoa is a pan moana idea of a partner, a friend, a pair, uh, dualism if you want to. Um, you can also think of duals or, or binary or maybe um, other aspects that are related to the idea that things comes in pair. So this idea that reality from an ontological perspective begins with time and space or ta and va. Ta is our, one of our way of thinking about time where you mark time with beat, such as in ta ta ta, the beating of uh, tattoo into the body, or ta moko, and other forms with drummings, and those are all referred to as ta, and va is a spatial relations. So what I want to begin with is just kind of begin to talk about this idea that things comes in pairs and as a common vessel for reality. There is a tendency within the Tava philosophy is that everywhere in reality is our whole duality, and that all things in nature, mind, and society exist in duality. But then we ask the question, what do we do with this duality? Or, you know, if we want to take a postmodern and a post-structural critique of duality, what do we do with this? I want to make a uh, recommendation from Tava that there needs to be some sort of constant mediation, reconciliation of these hoa through the production of symmetry, harmony, and beauty. And I'll come back and talk what I mean by this. Now this shifts us from a position of imposition and domination, which comes through coloniality, it comes through imperialism, it comes through um, asymmetrical relations between male and female and so forth, to a state of mediation and liberation. Now I was quite, um, amazed at this point from the book Proclaim Peace that it began with this and I quote this extensively because it was sort of kind of the foundation of the chapter on theology of conflict <clears throat> and I'll, I'll just read it here because I want to kind of come back and forth go back and forth between these as our creator and they're referring here to Christ he knows better than anyone that the cosmos is full of tensions that are not divided along a good, bad axis. Many essential divisions, day and night, earth and water, male and female, justice and mercy, to name only a few, represent dualities in which both entities are inherently good or, at worst, neutral. While often complementary, 
These entities are also mutually exclusive so that when they engage with each other, they can produce tension, even conflict, at the places or moment at which such good or neutral forces meet and clash. New entities or relationship often emerge that are greater or more powerful than the components, um, component parts. Um, and so I, I want to sort of kind of build on this and maybe think about how this idea that comes out of Judeo-Christian cosmogony, including LDS cosmogony, and, and then sort of kind of thinking about that from also from indigenous um, cosmogony or creation story. <coughs> now, in Judeo-Christian cosmogony or even LDS cosmogony, in the beginning, God creates the heaven and earth. But <coughs> in most of our Pacific cosmogony, and I'm talking specifically in Tonga, in the beginning, there was the ocean and land. That's the duality, ocean and land. So here, um, when we ground our thinking on certain kinds of theology, it, it gives us a different view of the world and it gives us a different cultural context to think about how this uh, work. So here you can see here that the emphasis here is about the ocean. Of course, ocean and land, because that's where we're at. We're in Moana Nuiake, we're in uh, Oceania. This is the place. So the, the particular kind of duality would be different from maybe from a Judeo-Christian and even a uh, Latter-day Saints um, uh, cosmogony. Following that is another duality. Um, from the ancestral ocean and in the ancestral land emerged limu and kele, limu seaweed and kele, sea sentiment. In Judeo-Christian, following the duality of heaven and earth is light and dark, naming day and night, right? And I think we're pretty, pretty consistent in Mormon theology and that in all the four cosmogony. So um, the idea here is that the duality and the reconciliation is not about anthropocentric, just man-centered, but has to do with your relationship with everything else, including your environment. And I like that you, you already have already, both of you have pointed out the ecology part of this because um, grounding it in a different, and I, I'm, I, I, I think Judeo-Christian and I including LDS theology has this um, idea about nature and creation. Maybe it's our interpretation, maybe we don't emphasize this, but when you move to indigenous theology, this area is very much in emphasized. That the, that the um, conflict, the peace, the reconciliation is about you and your ecology and your environment. So I want to sort of kind of talk about some of those uh, area. Now, this is, a, this is just a, a, a genealogy of, of Tongan theology that shows the beginning of the land and uh, <coughs> ocean, and it comes down. The one in red is the one I'm going to be focused on just to, to focus up because of our time. Um, my ancestors, Fonuta and Fonutai, is land turtle and sea turtle. They are the descendants, and uh, their, their descendants, uh, including Maui. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Maui from some of Disney's uh, <laughs> movie. <laughs> and I've been very, very critical of Disney and their movie Maui especially Moana, <clears throat> but in that particular genealogy is the line that I come through, and what I actually want to show you is that um, Maui is a duality. There is another element to it that is totally missing from most of the discourses um, that has been um, talked about, and that's Hina, the female uh, element of, of this. <clears throat> so I want to spend uh, maybe uh, the, the most of my remaining time talking about the relationship between Hina and Sinilao. Hina and Sinilao is almost the archetypical male and female relationship. Um, and it's a story about romance, love, conflict, strife, and many, many other kinds of relationship in this. But it's also a story 
about the relationship between humans and sharks. And the humans are referred to as Similao, which is of, often the, the name that the, the humans are referred to, and sharks are, the, uh, are referenced as Hina. Now, if you want to learn about conflict, um, this is the, one of the, the, the biggest conflict and reconciliation is re resolving the conflict between humans and especially sharks. Now, the story goes is that <clears throat> if you are about to go on a shark catching expedition, first you have to reconcile all your relationship with everyone within your families, make sure that you have asked for forgiveness, everything is right, and so forth, before you go out on a shark expedition. And when you go out on a shark expedition, you provide chant, you bring lays, you ask for permission for the shark, in order for you to catch the shark. The idea here is that if you get bitten by a shark, that means you haven't reconciled your relationship. <laughs> and um, here's a, a picture here of a person going out, calling a shark, jumping into the water, bringing the shark in, right? Calling on Hina, this is the name that we use for shark. Um, and the idea here is that if you have reconciled and that you show respect to Hina um, in a way that is uh, uh, symmetrical, that all things will be fine and that you'll be able to bring Hina aboard into your, into your ship. Um, I like this story because it is a story that is based on indigenous sacred stories. It is based on this idea that the relationship between humans and um, their environment, especially um, marine life, animals, and so forth, must be respected, and that there needs to be some sort of harmony in the way that you provide that. The relationship must be respectful, it must be reciprocal, and so forth, in order for this to um, happen. Now, to come back to this idea is that the mediation and reconciliation of conflict is achieved through sustained symmetry, harmony, and beauty. The idea of symmetry is to either you have symmetry or you look at opposite of it, which is asymmetrical relation, which we see in inequity, we see this in inequality, we see this in all sorts of kinds of exploitation through capitalism, um, from an indigenous point of view, we got ourselves into climate change is because our va, our relationship with the environment has been asymmetrical, has been asymmetrical for, for a very long time. Now, the, the word that we use for, symmet for symmetry is tatao, which is the same word that is used for tattoo. This is where the English word tattoo come from. And tattoo, if you see all, most specific tattoos, are all geometrical patterns, they're all symmetries. The symmetry here is sort of a kind of a reminder that you bring all these different conflictual lines and bring them into some sort of symmetry, harmony, and of course, they are very beautiful, if any of you have seen the tattoo. So the idea here is to shift our thinking from this condition of um, imposition, domination, to a state of mediation and liberation. Now, the background of my uh, tapa here has been a ngatu, or a tapa cloth. And if you can see, the tapa cloth is full of all sorts of what we call kupesi. These are um, symmetrical patterns that have been created and organized in a way to show that this is, first, they were very chaotic, but then you bring them together in a way to create symmetry, and these are the symmetrical patterns. Many of these are very abstract. They represent birds, and many of them represent things in nature and in, in, um, in, in the ecology. They represent birds. They re represent shark. They represent uh, moko or mo'o, or lizard. They represent many flowers and so forth. Um, this is a visual sort of kind of idea of, of symmetry. And as you go around in this university and, and later, you will see many of these particular patterns because you see it in all the different um, groups that are here at the at, at this place. 
Now, I want to end there, and I hope because I want to have much more time for us to have a uh, conversation about this. But what I want to say here uh, as I end uh, my conversation is that <clears throat> in the book, it raised the idea of creative conflict and destructive conflict. And um, from a indigenous reading, as at least from a Tongan indigenous reading of this, um, the creative conflict is thinking about issues such as uh, bringing order, symmetry, harmony, balance, proportionality, and so forth. Whereas the creative, uh, or the destructive um, conflict that you mentioned in, in, in your book is talking about asymmetry, disharmony, uh, disproportionality, and all sorts of other kinds of imbalances that are created in our relationship with the world. And I hope that those things will create some opportunity for us to have a dialogue and to discuss this in its, in its reference to the, to the book. Malo um, Abito, and thank you. Wow, what a start uh, to the conference. And I'm sure as you were reading through Proclaim Peace, you were thinking about Kolob, do resurrected bodies eat, um, and the relationship between humans and sharks. Um, but there were some really deep and profound um, discussion points. And we're going to move now and have uh, the Axel Guards um, begin a moderated discussion uh, between the group. And then we will move to Q&A. But first, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We have some refreshments outside. There's one restroom around the corner here, but you can also go down the stairs, and there's more um, restrooms downstairs um, as well. But uh, take a quick break, stretch your legs, um, and make sure you come back for what I think is going to be a really rich discussion now, and, and then ultimately an opportunity for the audience to, to ask questions of the presenters. Mahalo.
Tim coming and, and uh, helping moderate this uh, discussion session. And then about 25 minutes into that, we're going to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. If you just want to raise your hand, Fred and Robin will, will call on you and they'll repeat your question so that we can hear. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a mic in the back. Also, just want to remind people that um, if you're getting really excited about Patrick and David's book right now, uh, the the Maxwell Institute brought a number of copies. They're selling them for 50% off. They're only $10. They're downstairs um, at, the, at, the, at, at, the, at the table. And uh, they, uh, so, so you're welcome to purchase one on, on, on your way out so you know what's going on. So I'm going to turn the time over to Robin Axelgard here, and she's going to kick off uh, this portion of the conference. Thank you. Chad knows I'm completely out of my comfort zone doing this, and you probably guess we aren't the Flumens. <laughs> we wish we were, don't we? <laughs> but we're glad. Uh, Chad knew we were coming, and so we're glad to be able to do this. Thank you so much for your, well, number one for the book, because all of our kids got this for Christmas, and they love it, and we love it too. It's a perfect gift. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At $10 each. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, we, we are trying to think of who we are, and we, I, I was smiling and joking with Fred earlier that we're a little bit like the deadheads, you know, that followed the Grateful Dead around. We, we're the Maxwell heads. We love everything that the Maxwell Institute does and what Chad does, so we're glad to be here. Um, anyway, I was thinking we spent about 35 years in the D.C. area um, before coming to BYU Provo, and many of those years in D.C., Fred spent working on the Middle East peace process. And I was home with five kids. Um, and at one point in time, I think the, all of, it was all men who were working on the, the peace process, and I think at one point in time they decided it might be a nice thing to invite companions to come. So we met in Delphi, in Greece. It was really a fabulous time. It was 1995, I think, somewhere around there. And uh, so while the men were at the tables talking, uh, we had a tour guide who wanted to take us to uh, the, take the, the wives to uh, this beautiful resort in Delphi. But we had one big problem, and that is she, she didn't tell us in advance what we were going to do. When we all showed up, with shoes on. It's a, it's a shoe story. <laughs> the Israeli women had combat boots on, right? And fatigues and all ready to, to climb this beautiful mountain and see this beautiful view. Uh, the, there were two American women, myself and another woman. We had Reeboks on. That shows you it was in the 90s. And then um, the Arab women 
all had beautiful high-heeled shoes on. And we got to this resort, and the tour guide was so sad. She said, I forgot to tell you that you needed hiking shoes to see this beautiful view. Anyway, we, um, without even thinking, we got off the bus and we said, we're all going to see it. This is a chance. We can't pass up. So without thinking, was there an Israeli linked up with an Arab or... Uh, we just linked arms and pulled each other up the hill. And the Jordanian woman that was next to me had her, her high hills were just full of snow. But we got up to the top and we saw it. <clears throat> we saw what, what the tour guide wanted us to see. And it was a moment for me in time. Um, while I had been home raising kids, <laughs> you know, I thought maybe if we spent less time thinking about. Um, the process of being peacemakers, if we would just look at each other and say, you know, I love this person, I want this person to see the same view that, I want, that I'm going to see, and share it. And so for me, it was uh, one of those pivotal moments. Anyway, I've been thinking about th that today, and uh, in many ways I miss those years, and in other ways, um, I, well, I learned a lot from them. I guess that's my main point. And just that l I love that you focus so much on love in the book. That's really the bottom line. So I'm going to turn the time over to Fred to do the rest. And just the, the, uh, the commonality, we are children of God, the underlying premise um, that you guys made so clear in the book and that, uh, and that several of the speakers picked up on. Um, maybe what we could do beginning this portion of the conversation is give um, David and Patrick a chance, if you'd like, to respond to some of the things you heard. I think, David, you've got a mic there, is that right? Okay. Just if you wanted to take um, a, a few minutes, um, and the, we've got 25 minutes for this portion for this group to speak among itself. So make your thoughts, if you would, uh, pointed, and then we'll just get a, a discussion going. And if conversation lags, we'll turn to Robin for another anecdote from the peace process. Anyway, David or Patrick, please. I, well, we were, Patrick and I were talking between in the break, we're just kind of stunned at how beautiful each of these uh, interpretations were and how interestingly they all converge uh, in some in, uh, you know, I, to, to borrow the ecological phrase, uh, everyone came came back to this this idea that that reality is in some ways, or maybe, <laughs> if we, as as uh, Adam has uh, pointed out, you know, maybe it is, maybe, you know, uh, but it is certainly probably at the heart of our of the book that, that we are that um, that the the, uni that the universe that reality is fundamentally relational ecological and um, and I, I just found it fascinating that, that that all three of you went to that essential truth um, or at least what seems to be a, 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 an essential truth um, and uh, a reminder not only that it's ecological in terms of our relationships with with others uh, with other human beings but also as Tavita did a beautiful job, that, that those relationships are much broader um, and that conflict ultimately uh, exists uh, in all of creation. Uh, and, and so I don't know exactly where to go specifically. Uh, I, I'm ultimately, I guess personally, comfortable with the... Um, with the concept that that peace is not ultimately finding enough chairs for everyone, um, and that the the reality of this uh, this universe is that, that that peace is about how we engage with one another, and that co since conflict will inevitably continue, it was before this world, it will continue after this world. Um, that peace is not about getting to some sort of stasis. It's a, it's a, or some sort of um, place where every everything 
all the chairs are there and we don't need uh, to eat, <laughs> but that ultimately um, how we engage the conflict is what heaven is, um, not the absence of it. Yeah, th those were three just phenomenal uh, responses to the book, very generative. And uh, so if I, if I would say one thing to, to each in, in response, I, I think to be to you, uh, and we mentioned this during the break, I mean, you helped me see one of my own blind spots uh, as just a, a uh, I'm, I'm so thoroughly shaped by kind of Western notions of selfhood that uh, I too often forget about what it means to be in relation to all creation. And, and I think the book, um, I, really what we're talking about in the book is human-human conflict. And we have missed um, the, you know, the, the conflicts that we have with the rest of creation and that, may, that might be part of the problem, right? That, uh, that, that the very fact, as you say, that we're out of balance with all of creation uh, may in fact be feeding the conflict between humans. And we see this, what are the nature of conflicts? Many of the conflicts in the 21st century, they're over resources, they're over the things that we wanna e extract from the land. Uh, and then that leads us to, 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 to fight with one another. And we see this in so many geopolitical uh, conflicts, wh which are actually resource conflicts, um, and s and speak to the to the deep imbalance we have with with creation. So, thank you for that. I'm waiting for you to write the sequel uh, <laughs> about how we proclaim peace to all of creation, uh, which leads to to Adam's very generative question um, uh, questions, uh, and and I think that. Uh, look, I'll just go ahead and say, yeah, we eat in heaven because I really like to eat. Uh, um, and, and, and I think, I, and, 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 but as you say, it's not just can we, but, but must we. Um, now, I, I, I think it has to be uh, a, a kind of relationship where um, m maybe it's, it's a kind of vegetarianism or something like that, where the only things we eat are the things uh, in which um, organisms have given sustenance to others that don't take away their own life. So, so I can drink the milk of a cow without killing the cow. Um, uh, I can, uh, and, and so, th so there's that kind of sustenance and that kind of ethic. What does that mean for fruit, right? So, so I'll, uh, I, we, we talked about this in e e email, it, it may be a little coarse, uh, for an elevated academic conference. But, you know, the question is, so if resurrected bodies eat, do they digest? And then what do they do as the end of digestion? <laughs> let's, let's, let's just put it that way, right? Uh, and and we, we think about that in a particular way, but actually this is the nature of creation that actually th our uh, digestive processes give give the possibility for seeds to be spread and to sprout and to find new life. Right, so it is, and, and that's how fruit spreads itself. That's how fruit generates new life is, but it wants to be eaten so that those, those seeds can be spread and germinated and, uh, and fed in order for a new generation to arise. So is that what eating in heaven looks like? It's, it's only the kind of destruction that leads to new creation. Um, uh, maybe, um, and, and Melissa, I think, uh, your notion of covenant conflict is so helpful and so damning that, um, over and over in scriptures, I think the Book of Mormon is so good at this, that for, for me, the Book of Mormon takes all of the, the sort of theological ideas and conflicts and everything that we see in the Bible, and it distills those things to their purest essence. And we see so many times in the Book of Mormon that the church is unable to do its work because the members of the church are in conflict with one another or, or don't live up to their ideals, don't keep their covenants. And so the church is witness to the world what the church was put on earth to do is betrayed by the faithlessness of the members of the church. And so is our ability to be a witness to the world of peace, of love, of sister and brotherhood, of justice, are we, um, 
are we eroding our witness to the world because we are in covenant conflict? Uh, so maybe, as Jesus said, we need to, the physician needs to heal ourselves first. I mean, this is one of the things, you know, David and I talked about this. We believe that these principles do have application for the whole world, but we have some healing to do internally, too. So thank you for that. For me, one of the implications of, let's see, your, uh, what I keep pondering is that, is the covenant conflict a problem? Uh or is it the way that the covenant conflict, in other words, is the, are the differences the problem or is it the way we engage the differences, which gets at this kind of, again, is if conflict is inevitable, then in the covenant we will have conflict, right? right? So how we engage it is the problem, not necessarily that the conflict exists, right? And, um, and um, which again kind of gets, as, as, as Adam was pointing out, is can we have creation without destruction? And the, I think the, the consistent answer is no. Uh, therefore, what kind of destruction? This is the, because we call it destructive conflict and um, creative conflict, and I'm starting to wonder if those are really helpful terms in the book, uh, because maybe destruction is also inevitable and therefore is it a destruction that is in symmetry and harmony uh, bringing it through bringing about new life or is it a destruction that is um, uh, kind of lay lays waste to the world right um, and so it's so thank you so much for what you've helped me start thinking about are, are there better ways we can describe what we're trying to talk about um, that incorporate all of these wonderful questions that you've raised? Okay, last thing really is, is um, in answer to Adam's second question, are, will there ever be enough chairs? Uh, I think that, and that I'm going with sort of King Follett theology here, in, a, in an expanding universe, uh, where the purpose is that of eternal increase and eternal creation. Uh, the idea, so, so conflict is a distribution problem. Uh, and so uh, the, the Lord says that the earth is full, there's enough to spare, but the problem is always distribution, right? The, the, the problem is always, can we actually get it to all the people? I think that's an eternal problem. So if we, um, if, if we become gods, if, if, we, if we lean into the idea of eternal increase, then uh, in an expanding universe, they may, there may be expanding goods, but there's also an expanding number of people who want access to those goods. And so there continues to be an eternal distribution problem. And so godhood is, by definition, trying to, it, trying to, um, uh, to, 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 to not just manage, but actually to make sense of this distri distribution process or problem. And so, so it's, uh, it's, 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 per, it's, a, it's an always perpetuating and eternally perpetuating cycle, but it's not a problem so much as an opportunity because this is the stuff of making gods, uh, of, 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 how, of how do you address the distribution pro problem, and, uh, and so you, you teach people that through love. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Do any of the three of you want to take a minute to engage a bit further? Need more time to digest what he said. Um, I've got a thought that might point in your direction, uh, Professor Kaili. It goes back, Patrick, to some of your opening remarks. Um, you spoke kind of about the self-sufficiency of our theology. That um, that's the way I took it. We have, we have, we don't need <laughs> anymore, so to speak. That's straining a little bit at what you said, but I wonder whether. Um, in, your, in the book, you, got, you talk about uh, Jean-Paul Lederach and his notion of uh, a critical yeast. And how would we, as the yeast, interact in the world of peace building? Do we bring all of the essential ingredients for the yeast, or do we, in fact, interact? Does what we have to offer, theologically or ethically, need to interact with what other cultures 
other faith traditions have to offer, either theologically or ethically, in order for that critical yeast um, to, to do its job. And uh, Russ Kiley, we talked a little bit along these lines uh, before the session. Do you want to pick up on that theme, how some of the uh, maybe aspects of, of theology or culture, let's broaden it. Maybe it doesn't need to be theology. Maybe it can be culture that uh, could make our contribution uh, more effective out there. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I see um, culture as created by God and create r really diverse cultures or even diverse theologies, um, which gives us this really rich, beautiful world with different ways of thinking about the world and so forth. Um, so the way I see it is that, yeah, we can bring all of them together, bring, bring the different um, cultures, different theologies, um, to, to help us in sort of kind of thinking about issues such as peace and conflict or, you know, many of the different other kind of challenges that we, we have in, in, in the world. Um, because, the, I mean, the other question is why did God create all of these things for us? <laughs> you know, we could have just be one, one monoculture and that would be it. So, from, from the, you know, just thinking it from our, even from Latter-day Saints, um, theology, you know, you create this beautiful diversity that allows us to sort of kind of embrace and be able to find ways to have relationship with other people. So, yeah. And we, we may talk more about the yeast on Saturday when we talk about practice, but, um, <laughs> but I don't want to eat a loaf of yeast, <laughs> right? Yeast is only any good in combination with other things. And so, uh, so it's, it's, it, it has to be this mix of ingredients, this diversity of ingredients uh, that, that, that allows for something beautiful, to something that where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Just, uh, the Quran has a wonderful description of this where God basically says, like, you could have created you all one, but didn't, so that you would learn how to strive with one another. Um, not in the kind of negative sense, but in the sense of how to, how to engage the difference. Uh, and there's something essential to the difference. Uh, and I've, I've always loved that insight. Maybe that microphone wasn't meant, wasn't meant for me. It, th this question reminds me uh, as well of a question that I had Melissa, about the story that you told, the really powerful story that you told about this moment of, of love, of, of embrace, of, of reaching beyond the differences between the two of you at that, uh, at that school board meeting. And I, I don't, I don't want to undercut that. But at the same time, I, I think we probably still want to say, one of you is right. <laughs> <laughs> and the other person is wrong. Uh, don't we? Yeah, we can still talk about that, but we just shouldn't try to completely annihilate each other. Right. Maybe completely annihilate the bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question, I guess, for me is then, what, is it, what, does that, what does that actually look like then? I mean... Okay, so, so you're asking, so with regard to this, I actually had um, in my mind a lot of really great slogans that made a lot of, I thought, pretty accurate but ad hominem attacks. So, um, so I've like edited my slogans now <laughs> to be more focused on the issues. Yeah. Like that's, that's what it means to be a good citizen, right? If you really love someone, you don't want them to live in a sit state with crappy public education. And she found this persuasive. No, we haven't gotten to that phase yet. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you know, so, so I think that that's the difference. Like instead of making ad hominem attacks um, and saying these people have done this, these people are trying to do this, then you can say, um, this policy is a bad idea because it will blah, 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 blah. And like focus on the policy as opposed to say those horrible people there. Yeah. Agreed, yes. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, so, so this actually reminds me of, um, of, of my favorite metaphor, which is sourdough yeast, right? Sourdough starter is yeast, but it's like, um, well, I, 
all yeast is in the womb, but sourdough yeast is like a combination of different kinds of bacteria, uh, different strains of bacteria, and they're kind of like fighting with each other for dominance. And some of them do better when it's really wet. Some of them do better when it's really dry. But, um, but, but kind of to what Patrick and David were saying about sometimes the covenant conflict is just just totally stymies, totally ruins the loaf. And I and, and I think we can analogize that to like if the wrong strain of yeast takes over, totally takes over, and it's not in balance with the other ones. And and, and then it, indeed, if the if the loaf is left to leaven for too long, you know, it can just get out of control, and, and essentially it just goes bad. There's like a fine line between fermentation into really good bread and things going bad. It's the same process. There's just like a, a dividing line between the beginning and the end of that. And so, so I think what we have to do is we have to care a lot about trying to stay in balance, which I think means engaging with other people and hoping that over time, like, we stay in balance. I don't know. Thank you for that. Um, can we go back to your story about the, 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 um, the conflict you had there about education? I wondered whether, so if we're in Enix days, if 350 years <laughs> would give enough time that maybe some of the indigenous conflict resolution mechanisms that exist, I don't remember the name of it, but one that Chad has explained in the past, a Samoan approach to conflict resolution, if those were tools more available in the northern part of Utah County, when these kinds, or even the southern part of Salt Lake County, when these conflicts come up, that the question of covenant conflict might either look different or it might not seem so so absolute. Again, it, it, the idea of a lot of the conflict now in the United States, the polarization bleeds off of broader political and cultural things that are going on that are affecting the culture within the church certainly there in, in the States, but if we're able to, to step back. Anyway, it, it, do you, Professor, do you want to, any, any thoughts about that? I, uh, no, I, I, I think this is, a, you know, when you live in the island or you're in, in a ba'a, in a canoe, there's no other way, there's no <laughs> place to go. You have to figure out a way to get along with people. And I, and I think this, you know, some of these indigenous, at least the ones in the, in the Pacific, emerge because we live in this small landmass. We we're in a canoe for like months, <laughs> so you got to figure out how do you resolve these uh, these particular kinds. Of, and and I think maybe maybe there might be a, you know, living in a large continent allows you to you know create your own area here and there and create all sorts of kind of divisions. Um, <laughs> we move to a new world, you know, all of that, and and perhaps maybe um, you know, um, and, and I'm I, I think both you know indigenous, Western or, or you know American, European, whatever you want to call, it, I I think both are important. I'm I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I think some some way of combining elements from both can can bring some sort of solution to to this. Yeah. So so what would you do if you're working in an indigenous context and you have a disagreement over what the community is going to do about education and then obviously then what's the process? Well, the, you know, the, 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 the process for, for us was, um, you know, we had to have lots of talanoa, which is conversation and find some sort of consensus. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of work towards consensus um, and, the, and the conversation has to be, you know, civil, not toxic kind of conversation, which I think is what's happening in most education board meetings that we see today um, because you know th these are the ways that um, um, you you begin the process there's of course there's other sort of reciprocal gift givings that are happening in, in, in some of our uh, traditional uh, cultures and that can also be incorporated but I think the first mm -hmm. is just having a, a conversation where everyone is able to to have you know so that you can hear uh, the the other the other other person and so forth yeah and sometimes those conversations take a long time yeah thank you that element of time yes, very important huge um, 
Chad, I think that's about 25 minutes. Should we move into the, the student Q&A? Okay. Again, um, if you'll maybe stand, maybe come to the middle so we can see you, read your lips, and uh, we'll repeat the question. If you'd like to direct it to one of the uh, members of the panel, feel free to do that. If not, then uh, I'll assign. Please, go ahead. You have so much experience in, in peace building, and I'm so um, grateful to you for sharing that that um, interesting contrast of you know coming back to the United States and finding that it's like a conflict zone. Um, I think that you're so right that it's going to take a long time. I think that we are kind of at a moment in the churches, um, j just from what I see from our kind of general meetings and the general facing media. Uh, where we're trying a lot harder to um, include more people to recognize cultural difference and um, and it I hope this isn't too controversial um, I think that because of our global nature and also because of the shifting winds of politics um, in some ways our political profile has been broken or changed or or jiggered about somehow, um, which is good in general, I think, because, um, again, I hope this is not too political. Um, you know, now uh, many conservative Latter-day Saints uh, know the discomfort um, that many liberal Latter-day Saints feel when the general church um, does not completely align with their political views. And, and, and that could be bad uh, in, in various ways. Um, but it could also be good because it makes people be a little more self-conscious about distinctions between politics, culture, and, and religious institutions, um, which might help us to uh, be more thoughtful as we try to see other peoples. Does anyone else want to? So, so uh, section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the uh, uh, revelations that talks about Zion, says this, it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, 
a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven. It shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. That's what Zion is. So it's people gathered from every nation under heaven. So there's a lot of difference, a lot of conflict, a lot of different cultures, hopefully bringing their gifts and their, in, their insights and so forth. But the definition of Zion is it's the only people that won't be at war with one another. We don't live in Zion. <laughs> we do not live at Zion. And so, uh, uh, and, and we, we can't and we won't. Uh, now, now it's, it's very different as, we, as we've talked about it. It doesn't, it doesn't say that shall not be in conflict with one another. It doesn't say won't ever have any disagreements. It says won't be at war one with another. And so that's the challenge, and I think that's the burden, it's the opportunity for every covenanted member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to say, will I be at war with the people in my congregation? And, and we may talk about this again late, later uh, on, on Saturday, when we, but, but we really believe that the ward is a providential gift to us where we learn to practice peace building because we're stuck with these people. Now you can, you could, it's easier to move wards than move off an island, right? <laughs> uh, but the idea is you're stuck with these people. Will you be at war or will you learn to love? That's the challenge that a ward gives us. I, I wanna just add, because you talk about positionality and, and as you think, you, you think the way that positionality, uh, the, you experience it, right? So there's of course the intersection of race, class, gender, indigeneity, right? Um, and all of these other, I mean, that takes years to be in that particular positionality. So for so somebody to, to understand that positionality and to come to sort of kind of be able to empathize with that, yes. that takes time. Yes. And so I think, I don't think we're, we're there yet. I mean, um, here, here in our panel here, we're all different positionality and we're, we're trying to work and, and, and be able to, to see it from, from our different, you know, experiences. Yeah. Thank you very much. Another question, please. Uh, yes, uh, let me just first preface by saying I haven't read your book. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, it's on my list. I'm going to um, repeat that. He hasn't read the book, but it's on his list. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are copies apparently 50% off uh, so somewhere down. Just in case it wasn't picked up by the camera, I'll repeat, just if David and, and Patrick could comment on what the unique contribution the Restored Gospel has to offer in the context of a long history of, of other faith traditions bringing, seeking to bring forth things such as symmetry, balance, and harmony. Thank you. I think maybe the place to start is with the word restoration, which assumes uh, something that has been and has maybe even always been in, in the world in when, when the world has been rightly understood uh, and is being restored again uh, in a particular place, in a particular time, uh, with a particular set of people. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it isn't new. It, it, it doesn't bring anything um, unique. Um, on the other hand, there are some things about Latter-day Saint 
uh, theology that are kind of different, especially within traditional Christianity. Uh, the idea of an uncreated uh, universe or, or a, a universe that's where matter has always existed and, and, and beings have always existed with some sort of agency. Um, and the way that that, a lot of the, the book kind of starts with that um, premise, which is a very heretical premise within uh, mainstream Christianity, um, that we have co are co-eternal with God. And what does that mean then in terms of how power works uh, and the way that it, everything is relational? Uh, when, when, you, when everyone has always existed, then that means we've always been in relationship with one another. And that means that that, that lends itself to certain kinds of dynamics. Um, and it means that peace has a certain definition as Adam pointed out so nicely, but that, that kind of a reality means that uh, peace is not is, is about how we engage those relationships, how we deal with a scarcity of chairs uh, or uh, with creation and destruction. Uh, it's a, it kind of in constant, a, a universe that's in constant motion. Um, so in that sense, it's, we're bringing something unusual to the Christian table. Um, and uh, and then we have this also all of these um, kind of wonderful stories that, that are you know part of the restoration scripture, Enoch, um, Abraham, Pearl of Great Price, and then in the Book of Mormon and others where we where these kinds of dynamics play out and we can see them um, working out in ways that are uh, the, the concepts aren't new but the the examples are. Yeah, so the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, I mean, this isn't quite getting it. <clears throat> I mean, it gets at some of the implications of this, which uh, uh, the anti-Nephi-Lehi story is just one of the, the great stories that we bring to the table. Um, when I go to, uh, I, I, well, the first time I, I experienced this is when I was at a nonviolent seminar and they were wondering why this Mormon was showing up because it was basically a bunch of kind of progressive Christians uh, and, and it was a workshop on how to do nonviolence. It was sponsored by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which formed in, in uh, the wake of, or formed in the middle of World War I, um, and very committed to nonviolence principles. At lunch, I'm sharing, they're, they're kind of questioning me, kind of, some of them I think were, thought I was maybe a spy, you know, <laughs> or what I was doing there. But as they, uh, what I, I shared with them was the story of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's and the, the ways in which they transformed conflict by going out and meeting their brethren and, and, um, and loving their, their attackers. Uh, and as I told them the story, uh, they universally were saying, that is a fantastic, you need to get that story out to more people. I'm like, yeah, we do. Um, and so, uh, it's a story that I think even as Latter-day Saints, we don't fully understand the power of it uh, and the, the principles that are, that are involved in that, um, in that example. And it is a remarkably unique story in, within the sacred canons of, of world religion. It's a, it's a fantastic story. I'd like to ask um, the other three panelists maybe... Uh, to respond to the same question. Just what do you see as something, what, what uniquely that uh, the restoration has to offer along these lines? Anything that you'd add, might add? Yeah, I would just, I would echo David here to say what we might have here in the restoration, again, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what we as Latter-day Saints actually believe. Uh, <laughs> about those big picture kinds of things. Uh, but what we might have is a kind of uh, profoundly heretical version of Christianity that ports all of those traditional Christian beliefs and doctrines into the context of an interdependent reality, which flies in the face of the traditional Christian picture. 
I think we have organization, a kind of ethos of collective work that was founded um, you know, with organizations like, like the Relief Society, with the, you know, organizing. You know, Joseph Smith was, it seemed to be always creating these new groups of people, like the quorums and the presidencies and the, you know, he was just like a kind of organizational maniac, you know, just organizing all these different groups of people and, and, and endowing them with power in the sense that they could, you know, do stuff, really important stuff together. Um, this group that I'm talking about uh, in my home state, um, they are super organized and I, I swear, I, I know it's straight from Relief Society. Um, <laughs> and that's why they're so effective. You know, most ruining Utah's public education. But, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think that's like really important and, and, and that's one of the reasons why I admire them so much as well because they got a bunch of people and you know, women have, have are kind of key engines of local Latter-day Saint organization as well. Um, so they, they just got a bunch of people together and they did this thing which they want, th which they think will help fix the world. Yeah, and so I think we, we have this kind of idea that like if we wanna fix the world, we gotta get a bunch of our people together and we'll go fix the world. And, and this has been my experience many times for various projects. You know, I, I wanted to do something to fix the world and I just enlisted a bunch of Latter-day Saints, mostly women, and we did awesome stuff. So I think that's like, um, the, I think our theology is really profound and, and distinctive. And I, but I think our organizational ethos, which is something a little harder to kind of document, but which is clearly a thing and which, you know, is sustained by the community over time um, in, in different places, not just in the United States, in, in every different place, I think it's really powerful. Yeah, and just add to the organizational part is, um, you know, at the heart of it is this um, idea of reciprocity that I talked about. And, and here is where both indigenous and um, Latter-day Saints um, theology intersect. Um, because, you know, just thinking about all the things that we volunteer to do or and do for others through ministering and so forth, um, <coughs> you know, we do, if somebody's sick and we, you know, Relief Society have a list that you have, you know, bring food to them, but then that comes around and you get to do it to other people, right? Which, which you, s you do see in, in other tradition, but I think we take it to a like much more organized le level uh, within the, the, the ward and, and so forth, which is, which is kind of the manifestation of, you know, love one another and, and, and so forth. Thank you, I'm just gonna grab a word, community. You know, the, the, in my mind, there's a lot of emphasis when you talk about theology, about individual salvation. But what Joseph Smith was about was creating a community. And what you just synthesized, several of you in, in your comments, is this is what it means. And to have as an example to the world, this is how you build community. This is what community can mean, even in a, in a highly polarized world. I think it's, that's, a, that's a significant contribution. Thank you. I just wanted to speak to, to what Melissa said. I don't know if you're familiar with MWAG, Mormon mm -hmm. Women for Ethical Government, yeah? <laughs> I've just been surprised at their uh, momentum. I don't know if anybody else has, but um, I heard about them and started to read about what they were doing and realized that they were really influential um, with one of our senators in Utah. Uh, anyway, go, go MWAG. <laughs> Please, in the back. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up the anti Nephi Lehi's because I've long been inspired by that story in the scriptures, um, especially where it talks about how when their enemies fall upon them, and the, in the end, more people are brought under the fold than those that perish. But um, it seems to stand in really stark contrast to things like Captain Moroni and a lot of the just war narratives that are found in the scriptures, in particular the New Book of Mormon. And I've had a hard time justifying both of those. So I'm wondering if you could comment about that and should there be more of an emphasis on the nonviolence in the Latter-day Saint community uh, or should we seek to find a balance between the two? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? 
So the question has to do with um, just war emphasis versus um, nonviolent emphasis as uh, manifest in the LDS community. How to redress that balance, or if it needs to be redressed, or should be? We do have a few opinions about this. <laughs> Fairly strong ones, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it, you, you just did a, a, a beautiful uh, s summation in many ways of the, of the entire book, which is um, part of what we're, tr we're trying to address is, and we do, we use 98 we, very, very uh, heavily in the, in the book. We do think that it is a choice. The, the Lord basically says you can be justified in your violence or you can be sanctified in your love. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of a celestial, celestial choice, right? Um, um, remember, bo both of those are degrees of glory. So they're both righteous in the sense, but there is a better best uh, or a good best or, or a tolerable best, <laughs> um, however we want to frame it. But because um, justified doesn't mean um, good and, and, and sanctified, it means allowing something that's normally evil to, to, to be done. Uh, so, uh, so yes, <laughs> yes to all of that. We, uh, the, uh, the, uh, a significant reason for writing the book is to try to shift the thinking, because the default in, in the current Latter-day Saint culture largely is justified violence, and then you have to, you have to kind of justify any other choice. Um, uh, what kind of a world would it be if the, if the default was love, assertive love, nonviolence, and then we had to justify any decision to, to do something, to do the other one. So we, um, we, we, we would hope that, that the book, if anything, is maybe opening up space for people to see that this this choice and the and the way we've been making this choice, and to maybe rethink why we've been making that choice and consider others. Yeah, so it's it's a great question. I think I think we'll take it up a little bit uh, tomorrow when we talk about the middle chapters of the book. But we so we've had some responses to the book. Uh, I'm going to somewhat caricature them, but not much. Uh, to say something like, okay. Look, we get it. You talk a lot about Jesus in the book, but what about Captain Moroni? <laughs> well, last time, I mean, I, I don't want to judge anybody else's what they did when they entered the waters of baptism, but I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not the Church of Captain Moroni of Latter-day Saints, or even... Thank you, President Nelson, the Church of General Mormon of Latter-day Saints. I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so I don't apologize for centering Jesus. I don't worship Captain Moroni. I respect him. I don't worship Tiancum. I don't worship Mormon. I don't worship Joseph Smith. I worship Jesus Christ with his holy and entirely nonviolent life, ministry, atonement, death, and resurrection. That's what I want to be. Please. That's where the common ground is with all the diversity and with all the diverse uh, 
question was, is, is it worth it? Was it worth it for me to kind of, you know, make an argument because I literally believe that politically this is, this is how it's supposed to be, right? Um, and then you think of the leadership skills. Is it for me, I'm, I'm Samoan, I come from Samoa, and the leadership, as Benita talked about, you know, the Ma, Ma and Ha, the space and time, right? It's such a big part of who you are. So my neighbor is this, my other neighbor is that, they send out text and say, you need to put this sign in front of your house. Well, guess what? I don't put any sign in front of my house. <laughs> right? Because for me, I have to make sure that I nurture and continue to have a relationship with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Right? And so that's such a, a big part of what you believe for us, what the Savior is saying, what, what do you actually bring in ministering in the kingdom of God? Right? Sacrifice. Even if it means that we have to give up, you know, our own political views to him. <laughs> That's Thank awesome, and, and uh, I would say, I don't know if this book is on sale for 50% downstairs, but there's a book by a guy named Chad Ford named Dangerous Love that has a few things to say uh, about exactly what, what, what you just said, exactly. Thank you very much. Naomi, please. Go ahead and stand up if you would, please. We So the question was for uh, Professor Kaili, how has his study and background in Tongan theology and co cosmogony assisted him as he interacts with LDS theology and culture? Thank you, that's such a good uh, question. Um, I mean, I'll just give you an example. You know, I was talking about uh, our relationship with creation. And um, I, I think we sort of kind of uh, minimize that particular area in, in the way that we have interpreted and, and, and see. But you know, my indigenous theology has allowed me to actually see that area much more clear. You know, this is, this is, this is Christ's creation, right? And these are the things that we need to also have good relationship with. Um, there's like five days of just creating all of these things that we need to have relationship with and sometimes we sort of kind of you know, take that for granted and, and focus only on, 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 on man, man and woman at, at the end, right? Um, so when, when I'm reading it through um, indigenous theology, it allows me to sort of kind of say, hey, this is, you know, we also have this here in, 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 in LDS. I mean, we have four accounts of creation. Yeah, we got the Genesis, we got the Moses, we have Abraham, and we got the temple one. We are it, all of those things that they're all sort of kind of telling us, these are all the things we need to have a relationship with. And so this is where it, it allows, I mean, there are lots of examples, but I'm just gonna give you just that one particular way allows me to see it much, much more clear. And I think that's part of like the diversity allows us to give us different lenses to emphasize different things within our theology. The others. Thank you. Please.
So the question was, in a world where there are so many competing sources of information and with a proclamation of peace dependent upon truth, how do you undertake to proclaim truth in a situation like that? I'm tempted to ask you, Adam, but I won't. <laughs> Fred, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But it does, it does echo the question that I had wanted to pose to Melissa earlier about somebody's right here, or maybe they're both wrong, but... Uh, uh, and being right is not inconsequential even with respect to peace. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful moment if, if Melissa and, and the lady uh, embrace and kind of look past their political differences and... Uh, and make that connection with one another, that, that's powerful, that's important, that's, that's real. But at the same time, what if part of that involves Melissa sacrificing her commitment to this position that has a direct impact on her children's experience of peace in that community uh, because she, she backed off of her commitment to that political position? I mean, the political position itself has stakes with respect to peace, apart from the interpersonal relationships and. Uh, and there's always just this, this, this deeply complicated weave of, of gives and takes of sacrifices being made at, at every turn, even as connections are being made. Every connection is going to simultaneously involve that, that potential sacrifice of a different sort of relationship or connection that could have been made. Uh, and that's part, I think, of that a part of what may be the inherently tragic nature of what we have to deal with in our, in our pursuit of peace. Don't you think that... Um one prerequisite for truth is trust or a way to build truth or get to truth is trust. It's like a stepping stone. So I think if we can build those relationships of trust, if people trust us, if, if these people maybe someday think Melissa is not a horrible person, Melissa is not crazy, and Melissa is actually you know, trying like us to fix stuff, then it makes it more possible for us to kind of arrive at the, the same truth. I'm not sure what that could be at this moment, but you know, it, it, it seems more possible to me. So I'm listening to this dialogue about truth. And having worked in an area, well, with many different conflicts, where people are killing each other over truth, right? So I, I don't think truth is just about, not to minimize it all, Melissa, about building relationship. I think building relationship leads to the opportunity to build peace. But truth is tricky. And and yeah, we're sitting in a room with Christians. I'm assuming most of us are Christians here. And maybe even all LD church members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't know. But that's not realistic. You know, when you're working in the field, you're working with people who don't believe in God at all. You're working with people that are of different diverse religions. You're working with people who hold truth. And so truth can have two sides to a coin. And people will kill each other over truth. And so I, I absolutely didn't do peace building without the Savior because I just, he was a part of my life. But then so was the Quran. And so was uh, working with people that, I mean, s I have heard of Gandhi by Martin Luther King say that the best Christian he ever met was Mahatma Gandhi, right? One of the best Christians I ever met was an imam that I'll talk about tomorrow. And so I think this idea that we have about Jesus is an idea that I have, an idea that we have, but it's not a collective idea. And so I think to, pr to proclaim peace, we have to go beyond our own truth. And we have to accept, I think, 
Tavita, you said this earlier, that there are many truths. And we're kind of lucky and arrogant at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Because we have this truth that we know about. But so does my neighbor. And so I would like to learn and talk about that more. Um, and what does truth look like to different people and how do we proclaim peace when truth is not identified in the same way across the board. Anyway, I hope that was your answer. I didn't mean to like um, Thanks for that. I mean, I, I will say that um, for me, I'm not a, I, I am a very pragmatic person, and so I always prefer relationships over ideologies or doctrinal ideas or correctness or orthodoxy. Um, for me, I think relationships are the key thing. And if, even though people have different truths, if they have a relationship, they're less, less likely to kill each other, right? It's easier to kill someone you don't know. Yeah. I've never killed anyone, but it's easier to just <laughs> want to, to want to <laughs> annihilate someone you don't know, right? And, and that's the one other thing that I'll say about, um, like we can talk about this with just war theory. You know, Jesus said you have to love your enemies. Most of us don't have like great enemies outside of church. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that's what like wards provide is like enemies that you have to love. Like I know a lot of people in my ward like I, I would consider me a political enemy, but um, you know, in my personal health struggles, the ward has supported and carried me, you know, just unanimously, and that's a great gift. I think we're about to. Uh to wrap up, I'm going to take a, a risk here and um, maybe plan an idea that might take root um, in discussion in the next couple of days. Um, I think Patrick and, and David could very quickly in their own minds list four or five names of people in the LDS community uh, who have had a kind of visceral reaction to the publication of the book. And Tonlin, to go to, to your question, I mean, there, there are, which truth is truth? Um, as I was reading a little bit about uh, Tevita's background and some other indigenous approaches to peace building, uh, the emphasis on harmony and consensus struck me. And I thought, wow, what if we held a conference not so much to put out our theology, but were the objective of the conference was to have those three or four or five people who were in your, whose names are in your mind, and I can cite them as well, um, come together. And the point was to come out of that conference with agreement on a way forward, to inch somehow more close to Zion. Um, because if we can't do it with other LDS practitioners or theologians about peace and conflict resolution, where in the bleep do we begin? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's so important. Uh, thank you for censoring yourself, Fred. Um, uh, uh, I knew you would if I didn't. Things were really going to go off the rail there. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I, I th I, that's exactly right. That's, that's, that's exactly the right impulse. Um, and so, uh, so there have been a couple of podcasts, for instance, that uh, invited me on to talk about the book. And let's just say we're, they were disinclined to agree with all of the positions in the book. Um, Thanks for censoring yourself. Yeah. And, uh, and we had great conversations. We had great conversations. And, you know, we didn't at the end of an hour. I don't think we agreed with everything, but I think we recognized the humanity, the goodness, the, the goodwill uh, in, in, in each of us. But one of the things that David and I saw recently that broke our hearts, and, and maybe this, this um, should be maybe uh, something as a community of peace builders that we should think about. So we had somebody publish a review of the book, or a rather lengthy and somewhat critical review of the book. Um, and this, this is from somebody who's been in, con we've been in conversation with a long time. He's been in conversation with, with Latter-day Saint peace builders and others for a long time. 
he, he comes from a very different position uh, ideologically uh, and in terms of his orientation around these, some of is these, these issues with his experience in the military and so forth. And he said in this review, he talked about the way that the Latter-day Saint peace building community has, or, or members of it, have treated him with disdain, with disregard. They have called him things, you know, like a warmonger. Uh, they've uh, completely dismissed his ideas, his goodness. Um, and he, it was clear in what he wrote that he has been wounded over and over and over by people, he says, who call themselves peace builders. Uh, so there's a trust issue, right? Uh, and so I, th I think uh, we, we do, those of us who espouse these kinds of principles, just like within the church, this covenant conflict, I think people who espouse peace and, you know, we, we're committed to truth, right? Uh, we're, we're committed to some of these things. But are we, um, uh, are, are we approaching relationships with people that we disagree with strongly? Are we applying some of the principles that we be believe in to, to these relationships? And if not, then it harms, harms the integrity of the position that we're trying to represent. Patrick, thank you. And thanks to all of you who participated. I think uh, years from now, you'll look back and realize you were present at the beginning of something quite significant, quite enduring. So let's uh, give a round of applause, please. <laughs>
Yeah, that building is, that is a closed building. Maybe the building that's open next to us, um, and you'll see there. After that um, dinner, we will have a workshop. If you're interested in learning about how you can transform your relationships through creative conflict, um, you can attend this workshop, um, this Dangerous Love workshop by Chad Ford. Like I mentioned yesterday, it is optional, but I'm sure he would love it if you were all there in attendance learning together. Um, tomorrow, like Chad mentioned, uh, we'll have our cultural sec uh, section. And um, before that, however, we'll have a student meet and greet at 11 a.m. to 12.30. Um, if you are a student and you would like to come, please um, register. The link is in our Instagram uh, bio. And if you need help navigating that, please talk to me or another one of our student field directors. Um, for all of those participating in the conference, for the speakers and their guests, we invite you to come so you can have these one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations with these peace-building students who are here um, at BYU Hawaii. I think it will be um, a good experience for all of us involved. And there will be refreshments. That is a bonus. Um, that is at 11 a.m. and it's going to be at the McKay Foyer Mosaic. So at the Flag Circle, if you were at the campus tour on Wednesday, it's right where they started there. Um, and that is all I have for today. I'll see you tomorrow and Jorge will come and give the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for life. We are grateful for the restored gospel and we are very grateful for this Spokane Peace Conference and for expanding our perspective on peace through the responses that we heard today. We are especially grateful for Dyson, Jesus Christ, his example. And we ask thee uh, that as we strive to follow the principle of peace and also follow him, the Prince of Peace, uh, we can have the guidance of thy spirit so that we can establish peace wherever we are. And we ask you for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.